the um, title is Extreme Weather and the Human Response. Uh, this picture reminds us that this is a global problem, although uh, much of my talk will be focused on the United States um, extreme weather and the human response in the United States. So we'll just get, uh, we'll just move right along here. This little sketch shows the separation of the man-made world, the human activity on the lower left, and the natural world that we're concerned with for climate and all the rest of the slide. The humans are in control. They can, they can twist that knob called CO2, and we've been twisting it, and we put more CO2 into the air, and that causes, um, although CO2 itself only causes 25% of the warming, uh, it is a trigger for to put more water into the atmosphere and hence create uh, warmer air as well. And that puts more water vapor into the, um, into the air and that creates more warm wa water and warm air. So you get a positive feedback loop that is triggered by the carbon dioxide that is emitted. Global warming then has its own set of uh, children called uh, climate change effects that are manifested in the atmosphere, the biosphere, and the cryosphere, which is the ice portion of our planet. And the weakest link in this uh, circle is the one labeled J. Uh, that stands for journalists. And the journalists uh, give us feedback from the scientists who are working with in the world of the atmosphere, the biosphere, and the cryosphere, and give us um, articles and papers and magazines. I rely solely on the written uh, science journalism uh, for, the, uh, for my slides. So we'll move around this. Um, we'll actually be in that white box for the first half of the talk, and then we'll move to the lower left box. So here we go. I have only one slide on global warming. This is it. This goes from 1880 to the present, and these are temperature anomalies in degrees C. The uh, slide is normalized to the 1950 to 1980 time period, and you can see a more rapid increase starting around 1970, more or less coincident with industrialization in, in Asia when things really started to take off. And notice that this market upward trend at the very right edge of that slide. So, the cryosphere. Let's look at the people who work in ice first. This is uh, Lonnie Thompson, who spent his career on the high uh, elevation land glaciers of the world, uh, drilling ice cores with a band of intrepid graduate students working at 17, 18,000 feet without oxygen taking the cores back to Ohio State University and measuring oxygen isotopes, splicing together a record, a climate record over the last uh, uh, five to 10,000 years and more, and receiving the National Medal of Science uh, for his work. Another climate scientist, Gordon Hamilton, uh, worked Antarctica, worked the, the uh, problem of ice uh, movement into the um, Antarctic Ocean. And he, unfortunately, it's a hazardous occupation. He died last month um, in a, an accident uh, when the snow machine he was on plunged into a crevasse. So land glaciers have not been in steady state. They've been disappearing. Here's the Muir Glacier in Alaska over a time period of, uh, of 65 years. Here's likewise as a glacier in Switzerland 1985 to 2007, now, again, now you see it, now you don't. The pink on this map, this is a view of the, of the top of the world, the Arctic. The white uh, is Greenland, the continent of, semi-continent of Greenland. The pink is the um, color-coded um, Arctic ice uh, on the Arctic Ocean, and you can see it's its change and reduction in area from 1992 on the left to 2012 on the right. And most of the graphs of the minimum uh, ice extent over the, that time period 
uh, reflects uh, this kind of change. The top says that the Arctic sea ice has not been at levels as low as today's for at least five to 7,000 years. The biosphere, well, that's the world of stuff that, uh, that grows. Here's one of the researchers. She uh, did a PhD at Stanford, uh, not finished not too long ago, on the dieback of yellow cedar, a truly noble tree on the southeastern coast of Alaska. Uh, Alaska itself has been uh, stressed more than other parts of the world, as has all the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic warms more quickly than the rest of the planet. And the uh, key to the dieback of the yellow cedar, as determined by her thesis work, was that um, the um, uh, roots of the yellow cedars are uh, exposed um, more in the springtime now because of early uh, snow melt. And so that results in the death of the yellow cedar. Is it possible to reduce the spots? Would that help the contrast on, on the screen, do you think? Okay. Um, so um, other aspects of the biosphere are, this is an Australian uh, coral expert. He was um, uh, one of the first people to photograph the bleaching of coral. He was also one of the first to uh, name a lot of the coral species of the world. His quote up here is, it's very hard to be factual about seeing so much destruction. And he is talking about the bleaching of the coral. Here's a little critter. This is a pika. Changing climate is hitting one of the nation's current animals hard. The study finds there are a lot of studies of this type. This particular one is by a USGS um, ecologist. Um, the, uh, he uh, found that what he was seeing really did reflect what they were predicting in terms of climate change for pika populations. And they have seen widespread reductions in the pika range in uh, three ranges in the western U.S. The pika is a guy who can only go up uh, with uh, warming. They can't migrate uh, laterally. So on to the atmosphere. Um, and this is the place where we find extreme weather. This is, uh, first we'll look at, at heat waves. This uh, map here is the uh, land and ocean temperature departures um, from average, uh, this is for March of, of uh, 2016. And you may wonder why did I pick March? The answer is it doesn't matter what month I picked in the last year, they all are the hottest on record since 1880. Uh, so we've had a tremendous surge in warm temperatures in the last uh, year and a half. Here you see warming up to five degrees C, that's the darkest red uh, in Alaska and Northwest Canada in um, uh, the stands of Central Asia and Siberia and also warming in um, uh, Africa and Australia and other parts of the world. You also see a lot of blue and this uh, reflects that some portions of the world were actually below average. So when you see a global temperature that's portrayed as a number, what it is is a, an average of all these sectors of the earth by latitude and longitude, uh, averaging up uh, these temperature departures for a given uh, month or day um, uh, for, for presentation. So it's actually a very involved process to, to derive a global temperature. Um, North America is flooded in warmth and there's no sign of real winter, said the Washington Post just uh, the, just a week or so ago. And here is a map of that warmth. Colorado was on the, uh, certainly felt it on the southern edge of this warm blob. The uh, jet stream was on vacation for several months. And this blob extends from central uh, United States northward through Canada and up and over the Arctic Ocean and then hooks around and hits the uh, eastern coast of Greenland. It's quite a remarkable feature, and this persisted for some time. The fall has been so warm, some cities are setting records for the latest first freeze in 2016. 
This is uh, extreme heat in the southwestern U.S. of uh, June of this year. The um, uh, high pressure system just stayed there in the middle of June. It was record breaking. This particular event was driven by, a, uh, by that heat dome. Phoenix hit 118, uh, Tucson 115, Yuma uh, got to 120. Stay out of, stay out of Yuma. <laughs> Don't take the, tr if you could catch a train out of Yuma, take it. Uh, this is a researcher from uh, Australia, a heat wave researcher of all things. Uh, sh the quote here is, um, she looks at data. This is scary, she says. No one really wants to know that two degrees C warming means we will have an extra 20, extra 20 heat wave days here in Australia. Uh, she says, I don't do this to get depressed. I do this to get things to change so it doesn't get as bad as it currently looks like it will. That's not terribly cheerful. Okay, here's the, um, here's the statistical way to view extreme weather. This is a, a, a bell curve, a normal distribution, and there's two of them on here. The one um, of, quote, normal conditions is the solid one, and the one with uh, abnormal or uh, conditions exhibiting change of some kind uh, is the dashed one. And all you do here is plot some phenomena of interest like temperature on the horizontal axis and the number of times that occurred um, on the vertical axis. And you get the data to <laughs> gin up one of these things. The uh, thing is that if you shift the mean from the solid to the dash, then you increase the extremes on the right-hand side, which would be hotter, more hot weather and more extreme weather, and you reduce the number of cold days on the left. And this statistical summary is illustrated here by data from Australia. This is uh, three, three time periods. Um, the first one is 1950 to 1980, the second is 1980 to 2010, and the third is the year 2000 to the present. So uh, you hear, see here the shifted means of those three periods with the most recent, the farthest to the right. So the mean has been shifted, the general statistics of each curve is pretty much the same. Um, but what's happened here is you get exactly what was portrayed schematically in the last slide, and in particular, the first time period, 1950 to 1980, there were just 2.2% of the events, that's the area under this wing here, that exceeded two standard deviations. These things have all been uh, normalized. Uh, whereas the most recent um, time period, that two sigma exceedance is now up to 11%. So if you move the mean, you get more extremes. And that's the basic idea. And we're used to this. Every four years, there's an Olympics, right? And every four years, you hear about more records being broken. So I haven't tried this, but someone please go out and get all the data on pole vaulting or something. And over the last 100 years, just graph up all the pole vaulting records, and you should get uh, something, a curve. But then segment them so maybe for in 10-year batches or maybe every three Olympics, and watch that mean shift. And why would the mean shift? If we had the same people from the same population in 1920 as in 2010, the mean would not shift. It'd still be the same people with the same poles uh, running into the same sawdust pits. But that's not happened. Uh, what's happened is the people, there's more people to draw from. They're bigger and stronger. They're trained better. They've gone from bamboo to, uh, to fiberglass to graphite. The technology's better. And by golly, the mean has shifted. So you get new records. If you didn't have improvement, there would be no new records because it's very hard to break new records if all conditions remain the same. So that's the essence of extreme weather. That's the way to view this thing uh, statistically. 
Uh, here's a quote from Kevin Trenberth, who works at uh, NCAR in Boulder, and he has a nice short paper that, from which I drew this quote. The anthropogenic climate change effect is not zero, not negligible, nor is it large relative to the mean, but it is systematic. And he could have said it is systematically positive, always increasing. That's because we're putting CO2 in the atmosphere, we're always moving, always moving that mean. That's the hard thing to understand because the mean is moving fairly slowly relative to our lifetimes. Floods, that's a good one. Very photogenic things, floods. Um, newspaper photographers like floods. They go out and they get an evacuation photo, which is in the upper right. They photograph the, the drowned city, which is a small town south and west of St. Louis last December, just about a year ago. And then in the lower right are the fellows rowing their rowboat through the gasoline station. Uh, this uh, wintertime flood was among the costliest ever, said USA Today, and you've forgotten that it even happened, right? Um, it was the wettest December on record for the contiguous United States. How quickly we forget uh, these events that didn't hit us. Flooding in the South looks a lot like climate change, um, reports the New York Times. Uh, climate change is... Um, Never going to announce itself by name, but this is what we should expect it to look like. There are over 20 inches of rain fell in 72 hours from this, um, and this is a picture of some place not too far from Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge was more or less the epicenter of this uh, storm system. Um, it was the um, largest Red Cross response since Superstorm Sandy. 150,000 homes destroyed. I keep wondering if I got an extra zero on there. It's a hard number to understand. Um, the um, total economic loss was somewhere between 10 and $15 billion, but the insured loss was a fraction of that because not many people have flood insurance. Uh, by contrast to that 10 to $15 billion, Hurricane Katrina was $49 billion. Uh, September 11th event was 25 billion. Superstorm Sandy was $65 billion. There's a paragraph on the right I want to spend a little time with uh, because this is tied to what we call event attribution and this is the current scientific effort to say, to, to say what was the, by what extent was the probability of an event like this increased due to the presence of, of climate change. And the answer, according to this study lead, is uh, the global warming signal is present in the numbers that they looked at. Quote, for preci precipitation event of this size to occur in the central Gulf Coast, the odds uh, for it have increased by 40 to 100 percent uh, because of uh, climate change. Uh, this is uh, Staten Island and uh, after Superstorm Sandy in the year uh, 2012, just four years ago. The um, planning chief of Staten Island is now um, in the um, throes of uh, changing their zoning laws and building codes uh, in preparation for the next event. The quote at the bottom says, sea levels are rising and we are going to have to deal with that. So we have recognizance at the city level of places that have been hit that uh, they have to um, take appropriate steps. Um, that took the city of New York over a year to repair one tunnel between Manhattan and Brooklyn, uh, two miles of track, many miles of communication cable and power cable had to be pulled and replaced. Um, Governor Cuomo says, Today we're taking another huge step forward to repair the damage and strengthen the system. So this is called adaptation and it is expensive. After you clean up the mess, you have to adapt. Here's still cleaning up the mess four years later in New York City. This is de Blasio, the mayor de Blasio admits they still have a thousand houses to go in their plan to, um, to rebuild um, in their program that they had started. Um, certain geologic and um, labor uh, problems uh, hit, this, hit this program. 
Wildfires, uh, that's a little pretty close to uh, home. Here's temperatures in Colorado for the last uh, 120 years, 1895 to 2015. The average, the no noisy stuff is the annual um, uh, temperatures and the smooth curve is, shows us a rise in Colorado's average temperature from 29 and a half to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's gotten warmer. Here's just one of the number of fires that we've seen. This is 2012 was a busy year in Colorado. This is a uh, Waldo Canyon wildfire. Uh, the um, conflagration is shown in the upper left. The map of the extent is shown in the lower right. Uh, the Air Force Academy is there in the upper white box and then the, uh, the interstate coming down along the east side. Uh, this was um, 32,000 people evacuated. There was a lot of smoke in Colorado Springs. 454 million, almost half a billion dollars in, um, in uh, uh, that's insurance claims. 346 homes destroyed in Colorado Springs. And when that fire occurred, the temperature was a record 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the, it was a horrendous fire. The people fighting it simply had to, to uh, back off because it uh, was moving so quickly. Um, there are others, but just moving on with the statistics, this is a graph from 1970 to present. The orange bars are the um, number of wildfires um, in the western states of the U.S. You can see from the map what area is covered. And also the yellow line is simply the um, average, um, I think, summer temperatures for this um, period rising, rising from 56 to 58 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. The um, 2015 wildfire season was the worst on record with more than 10 million acres burned. And of course, you know what's happened to the U.S. Forest Service in fighting this. Much of their budget is now uh, just taken over by, by firefighting. So it's a severe uh, problem for them. Here's um, uh, it's kind of a summary. It was, I thought that it was too hard to relate the wildfire problem to climate change because there are so many factors in wildfires that are so complicated. But somebody actually did it last month by looking at all the dryness indicators uh, in the western U.S. and then um, correlating that with the acreage burned. And the um, uh, take home here is that uh, just uh, over half of the total observed increase in fuel dryness can be uh, statistically related to, um, to climate change. So in the last three decades, the study finds climate change played a role in nearly doubling the area hit by forest fires since 1984. Um, so this is a, there's no getting around this that we're uh, drying, the, um, drying the West and it, um, when it does burn, it burns faster, hotter, and bigger areas. And here's 40% um, of Coloradans live in the wildland urban interface. The red uh, area shows where those areas are. See if you can find your house. Um, it shows how much of many of us live in proximity to, uh, to forest. Okay, well, that's sort of the extreme weather um, portion of the talk and it's, I present it as kind of a, um, to me, the most vivid uh, reminder of climate change and the one you'll see most frequently in the press. Um, extreme weather gets the attention of, of reporters because that's news. Um, if, you're, um, if houses burn down and people are evacuated, uh, that's news. That's much more newsworthy than a long statistical trend over, over decades, which is what, um, what the essence of, of climatic, uh, climatic change is. So um, if you get back to the sketch then, um, 
that J, remember, is the journalists who are reporting uh, these events. And actually, um, actually that was a specialty. This, these are the people who are just reporting the science uh, of the events. Inside that box of human activity is all the other journalism that supports, that reports on uh, the events of the day. So let's take a look at the human activity and see what chance we have. What other, what other vectors are there pushing on the body politic, pushing on our consciousness, pushing on our awareness to do something about climate change? Let's have a look. So there's a um, group at Yale that studies um, uh, climate communication, climate awareness, and they came up with a, um, a phrase of the six Americas, and they have uh, divided the population into these six groups. On the left are the highest, um, th those who are most concerned about global warming, and they're 45% of the population uh, in alarmed as either alarmed or concerned. Uh, two middle groups I'll skip over. Let's go to um, doubtful and dismissive. Kind of sounds like the seven dwarfs, but there's only six of them. <laughs> so doubtful and dismissive total about 21% of the population. And these have the lowest belief um, and the least concern about the um, about the problem of warming or, client, or climate change. So here's one of my favorites. Um, in that right-hand group um, are the deniers, and it would kind of be fun, except the deniers occupy very important positions. Even before the last election, the recent election, um, the, um, this is a picture of Senator James, Jim Inhofe, a Republican from Oklahoma, who chairs a very important committee in the Senate, the Environment and Public Works Committee. And these committees are big. They have subcommittees, and the subcommittees have subcommittees. Uh, and here he is with a snowball. This is a famous photograph of Inhofe going out to the Capitol lawn and scooping up some snow and saying, see, it's... Um, we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record, but do you know what this is? Well, yeah. And that is bad enough, but we have a similar problem in the House of Representatives. This is the chair of uh, it's Lamar Smith. Um, it says he's turned a once placid panel into an investigative powerhouse. He's chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. This is another big committee and this time it's in the U.S. House, not the Senate, and he has made a hobby of investigating um, alleged wrongdoing by scientists, environmental groups, and government officials, and he shows no signs of slowing down. Whatever the future brings, one thing is clear, the panel has shed its long-standing reputation as a bastion of collegial bipartisan debate. And this is reported uh, the 19th of October this year. Um, this is um, reports on uh, international pressure. And uh, there are other pressures that have already been put on the president-elect. But this one is uh, I chose because it is international in, in nature. And this is from um, the Secretary General of the United Nations, the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, and a host of others around the world, urging President-elect Trump to take seriously the threat of climate change, which the Republican has described as a hoax. And there's a, a statement here by uh, Bonn that uh, they do plan on counting on the new administration to work on climate change and do other uh, good things and implement su sustainable development goals. So here's a push on the incoming administration. Trolls. 
We have trolls. I don't know if you've run into any trolls in the comment section of your newspaper. Some people have, newspapers have just stopped allowing comments as a result of the trolls. This particular one is a favorite television show of mine. It's Madam Secretary, which comes on Sunday evening on CBS. And the um, fictional president on this TV show did a very uh, unlikely thing. He, he broke party ties by embracing climate science and promising to prepare military bases around the world for superstorms. Um, he was then he then promptly loses his party's primary and now is running as an independent. But uh, the trolls got after this. That's a little white note in the in the box there, uh, talking about uh, how ridiculous uh, embracing climate change is. So uh, they're right on it, and uh, they're um, they are everywhere. The American voters have spoken, and energy won. The election, according to the president of the um, American Petroleum Institute. So this came out uh, just a few days ago, uh, maybe a day or so after the election. With the oil and gas industry facing lots of regulations and other policy setting activities that could discourage production, preventing regulatory overreach should be a top priority. And uh, this is a theme you see over and over is uh, one thing to be avoided is uh, excessive uh, regulation. So on the other hand, you see statements like this, that the risk of climate change is clear, the risk warrants action, increasing carbon emissions in the atmosphere is having a warming effect. There's broad and scientific policy consensus that action must be taken, uh, etc. This is from the Exxon Mobil website. And um, most all of the major American oil and gas companies have a statement like this or similar to it now, recognizing that climate change is real and that uh, there, we, steps should be taken. It's probably uh, not, according to my inside information, not leading to any particular action on the part of these companies, which would be against their self-interest, but at least we have the public acknowledgement that climate change is real, which is, a, um, which is something. Uh, this is uh, from the Christian Science Monitor, and they ran a story on Colorado. Uh, I thought, well, that's neat. Um, the left sand box is a, a solar, um, a municipal solar installation in Fort Collins. The, um, uh, it's a community solar farm and uh, uh, talks about how Fort Collins has been working on reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions. The right-hand side is a woman who has a, and her husband who have a small farm in, um, in Weld County, which is the heart of the denver Julesburg um, basin. And she's standing in front of the separation tanks um, on her place and uh, she's quite happy to have the oil and gas development. Uh, she's a property rights advocate who thinks climate change is a hoax, and she's bothered by the many inroads into property rights that she says are caused by environmental legislation and activists. So this is an important, an, an important, another important aspect of the opposition to uh, doing anything about climate change is the property rights issue. Um, Here's sort of good news. There's a gradual shutting down of coal-fired power plants. This one's from Minnesota Power. Uh, this is from the Duluth News Tribune. This power, this company's just announced that they would shut down units one and two. Um, and their goal is to go to one-third natural gas, one-third renewables, and one-third coal. Um, the bad news is, uh, or that units three and four, they're set on keeping running because uh, they need the base load and because they've spent millions of dollars on units three and four to get them upgraded for um, the mercury and sulfur dioxide uh, standards. So three and four are their newer units, newer built units anyway, and they've been upgraded. 
So we're going to hit kind of a, a plateau of how far you can go down in the near future on um, cutting, uh, cutting coal-fired power plants. Same thing in northern Indiana. So here's a summary of pushback. Um, expensive regulations, infringement of private property, impact on uh, coal and oil and gas business and employment, the expense of revamping our energy system and fear of increased taxes. And these and other things play into the denial of climate change and the entrenched political forces uh, that we've been encountering and uh, will uh, undoubtedly encounter more of in the, in the near future. So now that you're all depressed, um, here are some um, reasons um, for optimism, at least uh, I hope you'll take them that way. Here's a, um, one is the uh, extreme, advent of extreme weather that we've already gone, uh, gone through, some examples of. This is South Florida. Uh, this is a, a high tide situation where you get a little excess water on the highway. Uh, there's a, also a story behind this is that some entrepreneurs um, uh, have ginned up a website in the Palm Beach area, so for 99 bucks, if you're thinking of buying a house, you can log in, pay your 99 bucks, and see whether that house you're looking at is going to be um, above or below water in the next 30 years. I had an accompanying slide I just found that I didn't get it in the pack, and it shows um, a flooded a parking garage somewhere in the Miami area, and it, you look closely, and oh by golly, there's an octopus. Are being invaded, and they're, they're quite upset. Um, insurance Journal, uh, this is looking into the future. This is $800 billion worth of homes in danger of uh, being underwater. Uh, and so the insurance industry is um, slowly taking cognizance of the uh, forthcoming impacts. Um, the, so is the finance industry. There's the uh, Securities and Exchange Committee com Commission has taken steps to, uh, towards uh, making it clear that climate risks can be financially material. And then this proxy season uh, says stakeholders filed the 94 climate-related proposals at shareholder meetings of U.S. companies. And so again, it's creeping into the awareness of the insurance and financial sectors. Here's a public health note. Uh, this is just one of many. Uh, this is Lyme disease, which used to be prevalent only in uh, New England. In fact, I think it's named for Lyme, Connecticut. Is that right? Um, it's now um, the most common disease transmitted by a vector, a mosquito or tick or whatever. This um, happens to be a deer tick uh, in the picture. And they've gotten more numerous. They've spread out of New England across the central and southern states. Uh, because of uh, warming and also because the deer population has increased. So things are never one thing. They're always a mix of, of things. And um, um, The U.S. Uh, Navy has a very curious habit of locating um, many of its installations at sea level. <laughs> and this one in Norfolk is uh, in particular... Um, uh, need of consideration because of the sea level rise and the size of the installation. And here's, um, here's a piece of work by a lot of some retired defense secretaries and other high-ranking high um, people who put together, uh, I've seen actually a several of these that climate change is destabilizing the world and becoming a threat to national security. Um, so the, um, they signed an open letter by the Partnership for a Secure America that says, global warming is shaping a world that is more unstable, resource constrained, uh, violent, and disaster prone. And there's a lot to this, obviously. There's, there's drought, which affects agriculture, which causes people to move. Uh, there's the um, other instabilities of anything that will cause people to move, causes instability, causes bad governance to 
rise to the fore or become more important than it would be if we didn't have the disasters to contend with. So anyway, the point of this slide is uh, sec it is a security issue. Big lateral step here, this is the response of cities. Um, city of Fort Collins has been proactive as have other cities on the front range. Uh, this is an ad for a climate economy advisor. Um, just one guy trying to do the work of 10. I don't know if the position's been filled. Uh, this ad appeared uh, during, the, uh, during the summer, uh, posted June of uh, 2016. Um, so um, many cities have instituted uh, sustainability councils, sustainability boards, maybe one or two staffers of sustainability. Um, so there's an action at the city level that I think is, uh, we're gradually seeing a lot more activity in that area. Um, back on the East Coast, MIT announced a five-year plan for action on uh, climate change. And this is interesting. It was, um, a lot of it was driven by the students. And they, uh, the Institute responded with a lot of initiatives the Center for Global Climate Change, a, a, a um, web-based outfit on crowdsourcing to get ideas on how to counter climate change, eight low-carbon energy centers, uh, and, uh, and then using the MIT campus as kind of a test bed to uh, come up with ways to reduce, um, to reduce the carbon footprint. And there's a very interesting quote here from the president of MIT um, urging everyone to get involved with combating climate change. This is not a typical statement that you see from a president of university reaching out to the general population and warning them of a serious problem and asking for involvement. There's a cheerful looking fellow who uh, wrote a little paper last year called uh, an encyclical. It's a remarkable document um, I thought when I opened it, oh, this is going to be put me to sleep really fast, but it doesn't. It uh, wakes you right up, um, and it's a page turner. The climate is a common good belonging to all and meant for all. At the global level, it is a complex system linked to many of the essential conditions for human life. In another section, there's a quote, a very solid scientific consensus indicates that we are presently witnessing a disturbing warming of the climate system. So we, here we have the uh, push for moral authority. In terms of the technology that's so dear to the heart of this particular Cress organization, here's wind turbines in Iowa. And uh, there they are, by golly. Iowa, I think, is now over 30% in terms of its electric energy generation is now comes from wind. And this has come because state officials have long supported renewables, and I was one of the leaders in the nation. Facebook and Google are taking notice because they're looking for places with clean energy to put their data centers. And it's because Iowa put in tax laws, exemptions and encouragements, tax credits that encouraged uh, wind power. So, by golly, who would have guessed? Um, here's Colorado, they got uh, recent approval to Excel to put in a um, 600 megawatt uh, wind system in eastern Colorado. That was granted last month and then last week uh, there was another uh, PUC action um, to approve 390 megawatts of new solar. So we have here 1,000 megawatts of new renewable energy that's now been approved by the Public Utilities Commission. So Colorado has, uh, like Iowa, has moved ahead with uh, state-funded uh, uh, support or state incentives. Uh, Martin and I toured this place uh, about a month ago. Uh, it's up in um, Broomfield and it's a small shop bunch of engineers who got this idea of 
If we could build towers that were taller than 80 meters, we can get a lot more energy out of a turbine because the wind blows faster at higher elevations. So they <laughs> came up with this idea to build tapered, tapered spiral towers. Um, and it's um, their system. If you can imagine the problem of taking sheets of, of steel and welding them together and then wrapping a tapered spiral, I, I just leave the challenge up to your engineering imaginations. Uh, it took them a year to work out the equations and two years to build the prototype. But to me, it exemplifies the, um, the kind of offshoots and innovation that gets spurred once you get a, a new industry going. And it's true in every industry that is new. Uh, it just sparks a lot, of, uh, a lot of innovative ideas. So why is this happening? Well, it's because the cost of wind power is dropping as is 1980 to, uh, to the present. It's dropped a lot, it's now well under, it's around what, five cents per kilowatt hour or something like that. And coincident with that, drop is the rise in the red curve of the cumulative um, wind energy uh, installed. This is United States data. This is up to uh, 75,000 uh, megawatts. So 1,000 megawatts is my favorite unit of, for a large nuke or coal burner or several coal burners. So we've got 75 of them now um, in the U.S. by my by my measure. So wind energy is blowing away expectations. And here's a possible consumer. This is actually from the city of Oslo and the cars are parked up, uh, lined up um, next to the um, places where they can get a charge. So um, Oslo is kind of a test bed for electric vehicles and it's the kind of image that you want to hold in mind for uh, Metro Denver and the Front Range. We want to see this kind of thing in Colorado in the near future. This is good. It's just a table, but it's really good. Uh, it's the top five states with electricity generation from renewable energy sources, thousands of megawatt hours. So that's energy. It's not the power abil ability. It's how much they actually consumed actually over an eight month period. Look who's number one. Texas, two, California, Oklahoma. I didn't know there was a wind turbine in Oklahoma. <laughs> Iowa, well, we just saw Iowa, it's fourth. Kansas is fifth. So what do you see on this table? What you see is there's only one blue state here, if you think of the political maps you saw last week on television, all the other four are red states. So there's a real message here. And that is, unlike the six Americas, when you talk about climate change, there's just one America when you talk about renewable energy. Everybody likes cheap, renewable energy. Um, what's the guy, the former governor of Texas, I can't think of his name. He's Perry. now, huh? Perry. Perry, Perry. He was the guy who got instituted in Texas the capability of running transmission lines from the windy panhandle down to the population, population centers. So I thought, oh, that's unique, okay. So remember this one, uh, that's a, that's a, so here's a summary of positive pressures for uh, action in combating climate change. We've talked a lot about extreme weather, talked a little bit about the init nascent initiatives in finance and insurance, um, just a dab of public health, a little bit of national security from the retired uh, military and political leaders. States and cities, I think, are where the action is now. Uh, we have a little action by some prestigious institutions. You've seen what uh, MIT has come out with. We have the moral authority as exemplified by the Catholic Church and other churches. 
And the fact that renewables are now cost competitive and viewed favorably, can underline viewed favorably. So you say, what actions? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Okay. So we can take the lead from our neighbor to the north. And um, I should have mentioned that um, the problems we're having in the U.S. are almost unique to the U.S. They're kind of unique to North America to have the amount of pushback and denialism is kind of a specialty of North America. And it was true of Canada also until their election of recent times, which went the other way from the U.S. election. And um, uh, Justin Trudeau was brought in as prime minister. He reversed the thinking of the previous administration and has um, said that Canada will implement a national carbon price uh, with the price rising to $50 per ton of CO2 by the year 2022. Well, that's not, that's four years away. Provinces will determine their own mechanism, tax or cap and trade. Otherwise, the national government will do it for them. And here was an article in the Wall Street Journal, an op-ed um, about a month ago. I don't know if they would publish such a such a bold piece of literature now, but it was a, a price on carbon maybe coming soon to the U.S. Of course, to, for balance, they had in the same issue, they read an article, why a price on carbon is unlikely anytime soon, which was more a political article, whereas the pro was uh, putting up some real reasons as to why we could have a price on carbon. So here's the group I work with. This is Citizens Climate Lobby. We do work at the national level. Um, in most talks, I give a nice spiel about Citizens Climate Lobby, but you only get one slide, although we'll have more information in back. So here's um, what we do. We lobby uh, Congress. Here's 800 of us uh, taking the group photo before we disperse to the offices of our senators and uh, Congress people. Um, and this is lobby day, and we just go in and describe our proposal uh, for a fee on hydrocarbon production and, uh, and our fee and dividend proposal. A lot of things, uh, Martin's already mentioned a number of groups that work at the national level, so um, we are not alone. The state level, you also have many organizations here in Colorado who are... Um, working on uh, climate and sustainability issues. Here's one, this is Conservation Colorado. And this is a quote from their website, which I think has a nice lead, lead in. In the absence of federal leadership, the states must lead. For too long, Congress has refused to take even the smallest steps to address climate change. Colorado cannot wait, as the governor himself put it, it would be government malpractice to not pursue cost-effective strategies to clean up air pollution. And that's off uh, their website. And cities, um, as I already mentioned, many cities along the front range have sustainable boards or staff or something, some kind of initiative. Uh, Denver has um, taken quite a lead. This. Um, they held a uh, summit on Monday, uh, several of us in the room uh, attended. And uh, this is a photo of Mayor uh, Hancock who gets up and gives the welcoming speech to the assemblage, in this case it's 580 people. And I thought, okay, well this will be a nice perfunctory speech and then he'll disappear. He carried on for 15 minutes very enthusiastically about the um, actions of the a city and county of Denver uh, towards a more sustainable and a more uh, livable city. It was very impressive and they've hit upon the clever um, idea of, well, there's only a staff of three in the city and county of Denver um, uh, at the head of this group and then they have a lot of other groups, um, but maybe we can get some help uh, for free. So they put on a sustainability conference, and in, um, uh, in the morning, you uh, put together uh, your ideas for uh, things that you could achieve to help Denver with its goals, and 
and put in some deadlines and then in the afternoon uh, you have the privilege of uh, looking at everybody's and, uh, and digesting it and then finding out um, later um, get a synopsis across all the other areas of sustainability um, of a lot of other ideas. So I was in the energy section and it was, uh, it was pretty impressive. So cities can do a lot, are doing a lot. So here's my final slide, um, my recommendation to Cress. Um, even though, as Martin says, it's um, just as underfunded as anything else, um, I think Cress has a, potentially a lot of leverage uh, because the reach of uh, renewable energy cuts across the political spectrum. And we've seen that from the four red states and the, and the in there with the one blue state that is, um, that is um, already moved ahead with, uh, with renewables. So uh, to me, <coughs> um, um, the renewable argument can be made uh, very powerfully. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude.